All right, this is the first time we've got a guest at the podcast, and it's my good friend Joey Herrick. And uh, Joey, you're a legend. You know, I have a lot of pressure. I'm your first guest. The first guest. So yeah, don't screw so it up. <laughs> I have to be good. Yeah, you better be good. If we're not, we'll never have, never, never have another guest out yeah. on afterwards. Um, so the reason I wanted you to come on, I think you're fascinating. I mean, you know, from the first time we met, all the different stuff you do, and we'll probably have you on another podcast. But what I want to talk about is your foundation, the Lucy Pet Foundation. So tell me a little yeah. bit about it, how it started, and, and your ambassador here with you. Uh, well, this is Lucy. So uh, the Lucy Pet Foundation was named after her. She's one of my many dogs, but Lucy was actually a rescue dog. And uh, uh, but I, st I started it because uh, I used to have a pet food company, which I grew to be a very big company, sold it in 2013. Mm -hmm. And dogs and cats gave me and my family an unbelievable life. So I knew I had to give back. So uh, I actually spent a couple million dollars on my foundation to get it up and, and running it over the years. And in the last five years, uh, we've done over 27,000 free spay and neuters on our bus. Wow. So we go around Southern California to the low income areas and uh, we do it for free. And we partner with the city of Los Angeles yeah. and uh, we provide a great service. It is a great service. And I've heard of you through the you know, LA City Shelters for years, all the work you're doing with them in partnership with them. And tell me a little bit about that partnership, like how that works. How, do, how does, how do you help the city and how does the city help you? Well, they've just been uh, terrific. They, uh, uh, we started and had, a, had the foundation for uh, maybe two and a half years. And this uh, city came to me, uh, Brenda Barnett, who's the head of city of LA mm -hmm. animal shelters, uh, came to me and said, you know, you have such a great reputation with your spay or neuter bus, uh, would you be willing to uh, do 10,000 surgeries for us in the city of Los Angeles? And uh, I said, absolutely. So that's how we, we got uh, together. So why would a city ask a foundation to do that? Why wouldn't they do that themselves? Well, they, one is uh, there's, a, there's not enough spay and neuter buses mm -hmm. uh, around. And uh, we had such a great reputation for how we treat people uh, the quality of service. Dr. Karen uh, Halligan is our chief veterinary officer, and she's a terrific surgeon. Yep. And we run it like a business, even though we uh, we don't make any money. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right. And, uh, it, but it's run a certain way, and that's why it has a great reputation. So the city actually uh, uh, covers some of the cost of mm -hmm. the uh, uh, spay and neuter, as does the Petco Foundation. Oh, very you know, cool. The Petco, mm -hmm. uh, Petco Foundation uh, donates to us to help... Uh, make sure we keep this for free. That's, that's super cool. So one of the things is, you know, I mean, with the city, the city has so many responsibilities. It's, it's I think, one of the largest animal care agencies in the world, right? Yeah, it's, it's very big. And, but you know what? They, they love animals. They yeah. care for animals. And actually, just uh, 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 a little while ago, you know, Gavin Newsom, our, you know, our relatively new governor, yeah. uh, actually declared he wants us to be a, a kill no kill right. state. Yeah. So uh, that's a that's a good goal to get to. Yeah. We actually, uh, with the city of Los Angeles, became a no kill uh, city city right. for, for a short amount of time. Yeah. And I think I mean, there's there's issues with spay and neuter. I've got personal issues on it on some sides, but on the side of what, what you're doing, which is so critical, I think without spay and neuter, we're never going to end the killing in the shelters. No, you never you never will. Uh, when we first started this uh, about five and a half years ago. 80,000 dogs and cats every week mm -hmm. were getting euthanized. Good, but now, that's in the country. In the country. Okay. Now it's down to about 60,000 in the right. country. But still, think of it, 60,000 dogs and cats a week getting euthanized. And why? It's, they're euthanizing for space. Yeah. There's just too many. Yep. So, uh, so we go into the, you know, the low-income areas of mm -hmm. the city who uh, you know, they can't really afford to go to the vet for you know, right. 300 400 500 dollars and, sure. and we do it for free thanks to the city and petco right and you know what they're lined up we yeah. do five thousand surgeries a year wow that's incredible and and the people that come there they are so appreciative yeah that we're doing that and then dr halligan you know is also looking at all the dogs just to make yeah. sure she's finding you know you know ear problems and all kinds of things right. and trying to give them veterinary care so they get a little checkup as you're doing the spay yes. neuter okay that's that's huge too yes and these people probably introducing them to it is a huge thing it gets it gets the word out there it's a responsible thing to do because i mean a lot of people again you know i come from a working dog side so our dogs aren't spayed and neutered and a lot of people have issues with that so i mean there's this this balance between you know if you're gonna if you're gonna work your dog you're gonna show your dog you're gonna breed your dog it's one thing but most people just have pets 
Right. And they can't be as responsible as some people like, you know, like me or who, whoever, you know, some of the working dog people. And these dogs are just going out, running around, populating, and, and these sure. dogs are being killed. And, and most uh, dogs that are hit by cars mm -hmm. are unneutered males. Yep. Because, you know, a dog in the neighborhood, a female goes in the heat, so yep. they jump out of the backyard and, yep. you know, they're looking for a night on the town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't realize the importance of, of, of that, the drives also that get into these dogs, a lot of fatal or serious attacks on people happen when dogs are you know in heat sure and they're trying to get to each other it's another thing people don't talk yeah. about and you know they they actually there's a lot of data to, to back up that you know your dog will live longer mm -hmm. if it's spayed or neutered mm -hmm. uh you know certain cancers go away completely right and uh so overall it's it, they, they make a better pet yeah well it's e it's an easier dog to have Yes. You know, I mean, some, some people say, and I'm going to have another guy on who's against spay and neuter. Um, you know, my position on spay and neuter is we, we're going to have to do it if we want to get rid of the killing in the shelters. Well, I tell you, for somebody to be against spay and neuter, uh, you haven't been out in the field. Mm -hmm. Because when I had my other uh, pet food company, right. uh, I used to donate millions of pounds throughout right. the years to anim animal rescues, right, and, and shelters. A lot to animal rescues because I always believed animal rescue people were the ones changing the numbers yeah they were the ones going into shelters taking dogs out and getting them adopted yeah. so that's a amazing work what they do yeah but but once you actually go into the shelter and uh even though i used to donate you know millions of pounds to shelters right. and animal rescue groups i never really went into the shelter right once you go into the shelter yeah and i spent a week uh when we first got our spay neuter bus out at the uh san bernardino shelter and when you go the, through that yeah. and, and you see what's happening, you know, they adopt out 40 animals, but 60 of them come in cardboard boxes. That day. You know, that day. Yep. And so it's a space problem. Totally. And then I made the mistake once of, uh, and that person who doesn't like spay and neuter, he uh, should experience this, because right. I, I went into the back of the shelter. Yeah. And I'll never forget there was this, you know, they just throw them in barrels. Yeah. Dead. And I walked in, and this German shepherd's head was coming out of the barrel. The eyes were open, and he was looking right at me. And I, it, 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 it left an impression yeah. on me. Uh, and uh, when you see all the great dogs yeah. getting snuffed, yeah. and what was really sad, there was, uh, there was two dogs in that shelter, because we were there for the week. Uh, we were doing something with Allison Eastwood, who's mm -hmm. a big you know, animal rescue yeah. person. You're doing great work, too. And she does great work. Yeah. And uh, so there was a... A golden retriever and a Sammy, right? Mm -hmm. Together. And my daughter was wanting a Sammy, mm -hmm. right? But they said these were, they go together mm. because they're friends, mm -hmm. right? And so I remember I told my wife, I called my wife and said, hey, you know, there's a Sammy there. Uh, and I know Bailey wants one, mm -hmm. and uh, but you got we have to take the golden too with it because they're friends. And I said, well, let's think about it. So we thought about it a couple of days. And then I called, uh, and then we, we were gone. Yeah. And then the following Monday, I called, uh, you know, the head of the kennel there, Adam. And I said, hey, you know those two dogs who were looking at the Sammy? I want to take them. And there was silence. Ugh. They were gone already. Yeah. They euthanized them. Yeah. And in those shelters, you know, I mean, people often criticize Brenda. And I've worked with Brenda for years um, with Bound Angels, with the work we do. And you've worked with her for years. You know, I don't care who you are running the shelters. You're always going to be criticized. You're always going to be criticized, right. and, and people think they can do it better, and you, you don't understand. Right. Uh, you know, Brenda Burnett loves animals, mm -hmm. has her own I pet. Agree. She loves animals. Yeah. But you know, people don't understand when you're working in a, with a city and all the problems you have to deal with, not, and also the bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, city. yeah. You know, it's not all just being very logical. Right. There's other things that come into play yeah, yeah. that you, you can't control. Yeah, and a lot of that is the emotions. I mean, I've had my foundation for 12 years now or so, and one of the things I saw, I mean, I came into it, I'm a martial artist, you're a business guy. I think we attacked it very strategically. Like, this is what we have to do, this is how much money we have, this is what's going to happen. I think so many people who get into rescue, and you deal with them all the time, like I do, they're just emotionally charged. And you can't help, you, I mean, I, I can't blame them for being that way. I was emotionally charged in, in a lot of, on a lot of aspects of it. But you see this, this it's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's hopeless, it's like shoveling bodies. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, it's just, it's just such an atrocity when you see you take out 30, 40 dogs and there's you know, puppies in, in baskets and boxes coming oh, in the back door, it, front it, door. It's unbelievable. It, uh, yeah, well, actually, we, uh, 
uh, the other day, uh, before Christmas, we were on uh, KTLA News mm -hmm. with Gail Anderson and Oral Hershiser from the Dodgers. Right. He's part of us. We were all there, and we were grooming the dogs to get adopted for the holidays, yeah. right? Uh, so this was early December. And as we're there, this, this truck pulls in, and this guy comes out with these three cardboard boxes, all duct taped shut. Ugh. And he didn't even have air holes in them. Wow. Right? I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And he brings out these boxes and somebody from the, you know, East Valley shelter came mm -hmm. and uh, they opened the boxes. Here's these like nine week old puppies. I mean, beautiful dogs. Yeah. But he brought in uh, probably 12. And w what was it? Was it a backyard breeder? Was it yeah. just somebody? Ooh, well, well, listen, I think he was a backyard breeder. Yeah. But uh, he said, oh, well, we found these. Yeah, they always find them. Yeah, they, we found these by the dumpster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I never find any dogs. Yeah. You know, these people always find dogs and cats yeah, the, yeah. When, they, when they're dropping but, them off. But see, these were, these were bigger. Uh -huh. So, you know, they, they probably they want to sell them between eight weeks and 12 weeks. Right. Because they're cuter, they yeah. sell more, and they can sell Much them. faster, yeah. But once they get 12, 14 weeks, yeah. it, it's how do you can yeah. deal with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's, it's a logical thing. This is, I, I have such a huge issue. I talked about it on a podcast a while ago. You know, Craigslist, people buying dogs off Craigslist, people buying dogs off the internet. It's all supporting puppy mills and backyard breeders. And then somebody said, well, I sell my dogs off Craigslist. And I said, well, you're an idiot, you know? I mean, because you, if you're selling a dog and you don't know, and I'm not going to get into the breeder thing today, but it, the problem is what you said. If you haven't been in the shelters and you haven't seen a, a barrel full of dead dogs, right? It's it just I mean it brings tears to my eyes just saying it because I've seen it and it's it it change it changes you for life it'll forever change how you feel about dogs and and for somebody who says oh uh, they're against bay and neuter mm -hmm. well like you just said mm -hmm. they haven't been in the back room yeah and when you see how many I mean yeah. you know sixty thousand a week think that's about a lot that. of animals that's a lot of animals and and a lot of these most of them are great adoptable animal without a doubt you know who just want a home and, and you know the, I, I got into this on another podcast and I, I keep rehashing things you know so many times the emotional rescue groups get into saving these the one dog that's aggressive or has one eye or three legs or cancer or whatever and there's so many dogs in shelters that are amazing like that don't that don't have those issues right and we don't you know we, i hate when people point fingers at that one dog or point out that one dog always oh, aggressively killed two dogs but he really needs a loving home Maybe that dog should be put down because there's like 50 dogs right next to him that are amazing dogs. Well, you know what? It, uh, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, although there are plenty of people who really aren't realistic right. about the problem <laughs> yeah. and that every dog needs to be saved. Yeah. I mean, if you have, I've, I've seen it mm -hmm. where dogs have you know, went out and got ad adopted and within two days, they just ripped off a little girl's face. That's Why? Because these were dogs that were, they had a bad life. From the beginning yeah it's horrible and they were trained and treated yeah. a, a, a certain way mm -hmm. and you know how could you think it's cool or okay yeah. to let a family take yeah. a dog that you know is going to be aggressive and right. could maim you or kill you right for sure i mean some of those dogs well you're, you're the trainer yeah i mean some of those dogs can't be rehabilitated correct most can't a lot can't yeah, and p trainers are always saying, "Oh, they can all be fixed." You know, they can, all, and they can't. I mean, I can take an aggressive dog, can live with me, and I can manage it. Manage it. Right. Right. I, in my right mind, there's plenty of times where we're doing a program at the shelter where I'm like, you know what, I just just kill that dog. And I'm the first one to say, I hate saying it, but I'm the first one to say it. That one should go. Yeah. You know. And again, if if you had spay and neuter and you had responsible breeding, you had all this stuff like logically set out, you wouldn't be facing these problems because a, 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 a responsible breeder would cull that dog. Yes. Or they would not breed again. They would neuter the dog. And that's where a, a breeder would do the same thing. They're going to neuter the dog. They're going to say that dog should right. never be bred again, even if they don't want to kill it at that time. I'm a big advocate of really aggressive dogs being put down. Sure. I really am. And I'm, and I'm uh, an advocate for, you know, go to the shelter and get a, get a great pet. You know, but I am also understand the professional breeders aren't the problem. Absolutely not. Thank you for saying you know, that. Yeah. They're not. I no, mean, they're not. There's you no know, and they actually, you know, make make uh, sure that if you get one of their dogs you bring it back to them yeah yeah you know they'll they'll take care of it and find a find a home for it great example of that goofy's breeder i was at a show when when goofy got his championship in uh, grass valley she stood there and she's not a rich woman she took back a dog that was seven years old after the guy had had it for seven years she took it back and didn't take a dime this woman has an incredible character and there's a lot of breeders like that out there so when people say oh breeders are the problem you know, right now, it's not, it's neither here nor there. Nobody should cast stones, it's, you know, if you live in a glass house. 
the issue we're talking about here is, you know, you said the most important part. People say, well, I want a Malinois. No, you don't. You know, you have to decide either you want a working dog, a show dog, or you want a pet. Right. And if you work a full-time job, you can do great with a pet like Lucy. I mean, you can't imagine a better dog than Lucy, right? She's just right. perfect. She sits in your lap. She's chill. When you went in the bathroom, she was like looking all over. Where's, where's my dad? And I was petting her. And she just, she, she melts your heart. Yes. And, you know, why people want these, you know, these Mastiffs and these Corsos and these, these, these you know, super eclectic breeds. Malinois are in there. They're, they're, they're a pain in the ass. You know, they really are. And what's really, uh, I think, a disservice to animals in general, you know, the backyard breeders, Mm -hmm. because the professional breeder, they're looking to make sure that whatever they're breeding is healthy. It it doesn't have genetic, uh, you know, heart issues, uh, hip issues, uh, you know, certain things. And they, they stay away from that. Yeah. Whereas if you have, if you're just breeding in the backyard, do whatever, or, or the na- or the neighbor's got the same kind of exactly, dog down yeah. the street, you're going to make <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't know what's genetically in that right. line, which yeah. means now you're making an, a new animal. Yeah. And it's got genetic problems. Right. So you get into it for two or three years, all of a sudden you got to spend a lot of money because yeah. there's, it has a genetic problem. And what do most people do? They can't afford it. They take the dog to the, the shelter. shelter. Yeah, yeah. And you know the the other issue is that these breeders have been breeding the same line for years and years and years, so they know the genetics five, six, seven generations back. And that's something Craigslist breeders or backyard breeders. And I'm, I'm going to get slammed about Craigslist, but I don't care. But you know that's just not a way. It, L.A. Times, same thing, right? If you're looking in the L.A. Times in the back, it says, "Oh, you know, Pomeranian puppies nine weeks old." You're an idiot if you buy a dog like that. No, you know? it's it's true because you don't know what genetic defects are in the line, yeah. and that that are going to cause you yeah. problems and and money and and most important, if you get a dog and you have kids, yeah. and it's genetically not sound, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, heartache and danger. Yeah, right. Those are the things. So, well, so let's go back to your your foundation. I mean, you've you've got the coolest bus, right? The Lucy Pet Foundation bus. Well, I, it, it it is. I must admit. Yeah. I, I love our. Uh, our Lucy Pet Foundation bus. We were actually the first spay and neuter bus in L.A. Oh, really? to, to have a bathroom in it. Oh, oh <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, there, there, yeah, yeah. When I started, there was other spay and neuter right, buses right, there. Right. But when I built this yeah, thing, yeah. I said, I checked the other buses. Nobody yeah. had bathrooms. I said, you don't have a bathroom. What do you... What do you do? Well, they, said, they said, well, we always park next to a supermarket or, or, or in a park where there's a bathroom. Right. And when I built it, I said, no, you, yeah. can't, you can't run a... <laughs> business That's like funny. that so we have a bathroom in it and uh it's funny because the other spay neuter companies you know in town uh-huh. you know came through it and so when, when uh, there's another friend of ours uh who got a new bus and all her people said you get a bathroom like right. lucy pet <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good. Yeah, yeah you drive that thing too right i do that's insane yeah it's a, it's a big it's like a it's like a rock and roll tour bus right oh yeah it's it's cool you know it's uh, i like driving it yeah and um I, some like i actually drove it uh I used to drive it all the time. Right. You know, now we have our staff and yeah. not because I'm busy with all right. the other stuff. But a couple of weeks ago, I, I drove it. And it's actually nice driving because when you go to, to a spay neuter thing, you got to be there at 6 a.m., which means you're leaving at 4. It's nice to drive around Los Angeles at 4 a.m. Oh, it's the best. There's no traffic. Yeah, so that's when got, I go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. Yeah, and it's the best uh, time. Uh, you know, it, I, I like going out and do it. I've always been hands on. You know, yeah. it. Uh, uh, and it's good to go out and see it. And, and the people are so appreciative. Yeah. And you know what's really the cool thing? Mm. I actually went, uh, we were out in Pacoima, and uh, uh, I just, I came in the late afternoon. And, and, when, and late afternoon is when all the animals get picked up. Okay. And this lady and her two kids came, and they had three cats. And, and it was so touching. And you do cats too, right? Yes. Okay. And it, it was so touching because these kids, all they have is these cats. They love these cats. Yeah. And when they came and picked the cats up, we brought them off the bus and they had, you know, they've been uh, spayed and, and neutered. Right. Uh, they were so happy to have their cats back. And this will make their cats happier sure. and save them some money. So it's really cool and it feels good, you know? And, you know, I'm going to say one thing about spay and neuter because when I got Maya, she was intact. I got her from a client who bred her and everything like that. But um, the one thing people don't realize with females, especially, is the pyometra. Right. I mean, that's a complete death sentence, and you don't know what you're looking for. I have a friend of mine who's a, a well, she, she shows her dogs in, in uh, obedience. Her dog, I think it was seven or eight years old, died of pyometra. Yeah. It's oh, an ugly, sad death. It, it, it is not good. Matter of no. fact, when, at the beginning of, of starting the spay neuter bus, I was outside of it, right? Because mm-hmm. I had driven it that day, and then the, 
uh, one of our vet techs came out and said, Dr. Halligan would like to see you in surgery, please. I said, okay. So I walked in, you know, and, and we have uh, surgery doors are closed, but, you know, there's windows in them. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to show me what that looks like. Uh. Oh, because the dog was opened up. And, so and, ugly. And, and didn't know it until we got into it. And you're lucky you, said you were able to save the dog? She saved the dog, Because that's yeah. very rare. Yeah, she right? did. And pyometra is one of those things where you just don't know. And when you know, it's too late. Yeah. You're going to lose that dog. She saved that dog. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's Dr. Really Halligan's, uh, she's the real deal, too. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, and, it, and what was also interesting, and I was really proud of it, was uh, when Hurricane Harvey hit. Mm-hmm. It, uh, the year before Hurricane Harvey hit, uh, we were in Houston, Texas, actually with our wave machine. Oh, yeah. Which is, you know, I'm a, I'm a Lucy Pet product. I, I put a dog on that wave machine, if you remember, oh, over yeah. at Chance Marketplace. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we had it at the Houston Astros. Uh -huh. And we were, it was on Bark in the Park Day, and all the dogs were surfing. Mm -hmm. And then we got asked to take it out to Brazoria County, and uh, about 40 miles outside of Houston. So we took it there. And that's when we met the uh, people from the SBCA in Brazoria County. Okay. Right? So, uh, uh, so we had a big town event with the wave machine and stuff. We toured the facility. Dr. Halligan told them some things they need to do mm -hmm. to make that place better. Okay. And uh, so, so a year later, Hurricane Harvey hits. Right. So I'll never forget, I get the call. And uh, it was the executive director who was on the phone sobbing hysterically that they had 400 dogs. Uh, one just came in five minutes before she called me with a broken leg. They have no vets. Can't. The SPCA has no vets? It was the SPCA of Brazoria wow. County. No on-staff vet. They can't get a vet. Wow. And they said, we need help. Can you please help? So we, uh, that was like a Thursday. Uh, you know, we just we canceled our surgeries, you know, for the wow. next day. And I took uh, Dr. Halligan and some of our RBTs, and we went down to uh, Houston uh -huh. and out to Brazoria County. And Dr. Halligan uh, became, uh, uh, you know, incident command for wow. that shelter. Wow. And she was there about 10 days. I spent about a week there. Wow. And the things, uh, it was heartbreaking, wow. you know, of what went on there. Yeah. I mean, 100,000 people lost their homes. It's insane. And, uh, and all these dogs are coming into the shelter. There was already a lot of dogs before yeah. it started. So we actually did, uh, over the next few months, we did five airlifts and actually got those uh, uh, animals out of there we took we brought some here mm -hmm. we brought some to oregon oregon humane helped us took mm -hmm. they took some uh new york we put them all over yeah. the country so what happens if somebody let's say they lose their dog or it's, it's in houston and then it gets transferred to la well the first thing we moved were all the dogs that were already in the shelter first oh, okay. to, to make room for the new ones that's a huge point because yeah. people always think well you know i lost my dog we had a hurricane i can't get my dog back so the, the, the strategic move is to go in the shelter empty it out kind of right yeah and then bring the dogs that are there that are going to probably get rehomed. Right, back. to make space. And I'll never forget, you know, so I'm, I'm doing all kinds of things and cleaning cages and doing everything. And uh, uh, this older couple came in. They were, you know, mid-70s. Right. And they had this big lab, right? And, uh, and they were crying because their house was under, you know, seven feet of water. And they, they said, we can't ha take care of him anymore. And because uh, uh, the house is underwater. Yeah. He, the husband, is going in for open heart surgery. Oh God! You know, four days from then, right? Wow. I mean, they were yeah. they were stuck, so they they gave him up. And I said to him, uh, I said, okay, listen, I'm going to make sure that your dog's fine. Yeah. And and I took this dog, and I did not put him in the shelter, because the shelter was in such chaos mm. and and bad shape, and, and the cat section they all had upper respiratory and all yeah. kinds of things going on. Yeah. Right. So I put that dog in a big crate outside yeah. and watch that dog for the you know right uh, you know the next few days and then when we and i actually me and another guy because the dog was big yeah when we had the airlift on sunday we put that dog on a plane yeah where'd he and, go and uh he went to rhode island oh that's where i'm born yeah okay. he, he went there okay did and he get home there he did oh that's great he got a home so and did you were you able to tell the family yes you did yes See, I mean, that's so tracked cool. the whole thing that's amazing tracked the yeah. whole way that's amazing and it was uh because I felt so bad for that couple. I mean, they, you know, to be in the your, your mid seventies and yeah. you're going in for heart surgery and your home's under water. Yeah.
Oh. And that's the rare cases. I mean, I always say I just hate people give up their dogs because I've seen being in the shelter, I've seen people come in literally with an old dog, say, I can't care for him anymore, and then they go in the back and they get a puppy. I swear to God, I've yeah. seen that happen. That was not going to be the case no, with these people. No, and that's what I'm saying. This is where rescue is needed, right? And shelters are needed. Where, yes. You know, you've got to do the right thing. You should help, you help your neighbor. Oh, yeah. And you know what's also very interesting? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I learned a lot uh, going through that whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, but what was really kind of cool celebrities mm -hmm. i mean celebrities generally talk a great game i hate celebrities you know it uh, but do they really donate maybe or they, they just talk a great game well they or, do it to get attention yeah, or whatever or, right? or they go to something and uh, hey i showed up so hey right. whoop de do yeah but but everybody uh, uh on my second trip down to uh houston okay and uh, we went into this uh big gro uh, grocery store that was a uh, was uh out of business, okay, and it became home to 500 animals. Wow. So I heard that Renee Zellweger was there, okay, and she's helping. I said, "Oh, okay, cool." So I get in there, I walk in, and I uh, I said, "Hey, where's where's Renee Zellweger?" Mm -hmm. And they said, "Oh, that's over there in the corner." So in, in the in the corner, there's a huge crate for like a Great Dane, right? All I see is the back of. <laughs> Uh, the Renee, Great Dane? Renee Zellweger. Oh, the Renee Zellweger. Yeah. Didn't she's, look like a great she's Dane. She's in the cage cleaning out all the dog crap. And and she's wow. I spent the whole week working with her. Wow. And and every day she's cleaning cages, doing whatever needed to be done. And I was so impressed with her. And then on Sunday was gonna be the uh, the day we had to take all the animals for the airlift. Mm -hmm. So when you take them for an airlift, you know, they're gonna be in that crate a long right. time. And uh, so our call was uh, 5 a.m. to c come there. We're going to all spend the next uh, hour and a half walking all these dogs, okay. all the volunteers, and then we take them to the airport. So I told our crew, I said, hey, look, uh, 5 a.m. call tomorrow. Our call is 4.45. All of us were there at 4.45. So I pull in at, you know, 20 to right. 5, right, in the morning. Yeah. And who's already walking dogs? Renee Zellweger. Oh. I mean, so I was really impressed yeah. that here's a celebrity yeah. that loves animals yeah. and doesn't just talk. About and she didn't have like a camera crew there following her around. Absolutely not. Making a documentary no. about it, right? No. Matter of fact, uh, she was very nice because uh, we were at the airport and a, and the cam a camera crew came to the airport mm -hmm. to cover the Houston dogs going to, yeah. you know, wherever they were going that day. Yeah. And uh, so we actually, I put our logo on our plane. Mm -hmm. People say, Lucy Pet has a, has a plane. No, no, we don't have a plane. <laughs> we had $180 for a logo. Right. <laughs> that that right, stuck right. on. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but right. it looked great. Right. But you're, you're a rock band guy, so you want to have your own plane. Yeah. You well, we've got to get you a plane. Well, I'd love to have a plane just to move animals. You know? There's your there's so, there's purpose, right? Yeah, exactly. that would be great. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, so when, when the, you know, Renee was loading, she was like me. We're loading animals on the, yeah. on, onto the dolly to go yeah. up to the, or the conveyor to go up to the yeah. plane. But a news crew came. And uh, they they were interviewed her, and I said to Renee, "Can you stand in front of our plane?" Right. <laughs> and she said, "Oh, sure, okay, whatever. Right. You, yes, whatever you want. So sweet." Right, right. And she did the interview, yeah. which I have a, a picture for you. Okay, and we'll, she, we'll put it up on the video. And she's standing in front of uh, the Lucy pet on the plane. So cool. Yeah, yeah. but so, but that was very impressive. But it's impressive you too, because you're a really successful guy. I'm sure you got a lot of money and stuff like that. But you're not affected. I mean, you're like the most down to earth guy. You're like me. No. You know. Well, well you know. I, I've been very blessed. Yeah, and that's what I always look at. You know, I mean, I, I love what I do. You love what you do. But you're in there doing it. You're not just like a bureaucracy. Okay, well, I'm going to write a check and do this. You're actually there. Oh, I'm which hands I think, on. Yeah, but, and I think that's why Lucy Pet Foundation is so successful. Well, when I, uh, uh, I sold my company, and, and uh, I remember when I sold the company. I didn't really want to sell the company. Can we say I, the name of the company? Well, it was Natural Balanced Pet Foods, okay. which I started... Uh, you know, 30 years ago with Dick Van Patten. Yep. And I didn't really want to sell the company. And, uh, uh, but I had partners. Mm. And the partners said to, said to me, are you crazy? How could you turn down this much money? You right. will never have to work again. Right. Your kids will never have to work again. <laughs> right. I said, well, first of all, I, I need to work. I like to work. Yeah. Uh, my kids, they have to work. Good. And, and, the, and the third thing is, you know, I'm not done yet. Right, right. You know? I mean, if I didn't have an idea for anything yeah. or, or, a, or a drive to get up out of bed in the morning yeah. and I wanted to go hang out at the supermarket, like you go into certain supermarkets, there's always six old guys sitting there. Right, you know? right, right. And, and you think, <laughs> what, what the heck did you yeah. do in your lives? Now you're just sitting here doing yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, that's not for me. Right. And uh, 
Uh, and when I went to the first trade show, I remember um, walking through the trade show and one of the guys there said to me, what are you doing here? The trade show for food. The uh, pet, for pet, pet, in, pet, pet industry. industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, I thought you would have bought an island and been sipping Mai Tais. But this is after you sold Natural Balance. After I sold, okay, after okay, I sold yeah. Natural Balance. I said, well, no, that's really not me. I said, one, I don't want to be on an island because I can't swim. Right. So that's no good. <laughs> and I don't drink. Right. So well, then you don't need to be on an island. So an island sipping Mai Tais doesn't right. work for me. But yeah. what I do do is I create... And, and I, I develop things, and uh, this is all about giving back. Yeah. I mean, I've been very blessed. I was a successful as a musician. Yeah. I actually started uh, uh, a, a chili line with Phyllis Diller. You told me that. That's yeah. a great story. And, you should mention that. And uh, I actually put the first chicken chili in a can on the shelf in Los Angeles in 1984 <laughs> to when the chili manufacturer said, no, I wanted to do uh, chicken chili. Uh -huh. And they said, no, no, you don't. Right. They said, no, nobody wants chicken chili. Right. The chili industry is a beef industry. And I said, right. well, look, I live in LA. We're health conscious. Right. I think it'll be less fat. And I said, <laughs> I want to do chicken. Right. And uh, so we put it on the market. So that Amazing. was pretty cool. But uh, uh, I, I, it's all about giving back. Cause yeah. I mean, you get to a point where, yeah, okay, I made some money. That's nice. I made money when I stole my chicken, right. my chicken chili company. I made money at, when I was a musician. Yep. Uh, but what does that really mean? What does it mean, right? Money you is know, paper until you spend it, I always say yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to have, uh, listen, I'd rather have, been, have money than not have money. Right. But it's, you get to a point, and like, I'm at a certain age where, mm -hmm. okay, what did your life really mean? Yeah. If I can be the guy that actually really helped animal rescue yeah. and get animals' lives better, and, and also at the same time, you know, clean up the pet food industry because yeah. that's, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Yeah. We're going to get, we're, you're going to come back. We're going to talk, we'll talk about, about dog that food. some other time. a huge issue with dog food. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so if I can do that, yeah. then my life is meaningful. And there's an old saying that, and I remember this saying when I started in rescue because I, I didn't want to do it. I was a photographer. I didn't want to be involved in it. But there's an old saying, I think you know, it says, he who saves one life saves the world entire. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so when that. you save, I mean, if you save a thousand dogs, or you spay and neuter those dogs and you know that that dog is not going to get put down. It's not going to get hit by a car. It's not going to give life to 10 dogs who are going to get put down in a box in a shelter. That's a huge piece. Yeah. Right. That's something. You gotta well, think you about. know, I was a musician. And I, I was uh, I had a great life as a musician. And had I not have been a musician, I probably wouldn't have been successful in business because I right. understood the power of celebrity. Because mm -hmm. I was I, lucky enough. To, I joined a guy named John Davidson who was very mm -hmm. big in the 70s. Right. And because of him, I got to meet you know, Muhammad Ali and I got on The Tonight Show and I met right. Johnny Carson. I, I, yeah. I, I did all those things right. and it, it taught me a lot. Yeah. But in 1977, I went through a nightclub fire and uh, 165 people died. The mm -hmm. drummer playing my drums died. Because I didn't have to play opening acts unless uh, I wanted to. Yep. And uh, that was a ventriloquist act, so it really wasn't too exciting as a, as a musician. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, when we traveled with Henry Mancini, that was something, hey, well, I want to play that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sit in front of a 60 peak or orchestra, right. yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah. But a ventriloquist act, I didn't want to play it. And, and uh, I'll never forget that night because it was like uh, we were at the Beverly Hills Club in Newport, Kentucky. Yep. And uh, interesting because uh, I'm, de I'm backstage. And all of a sudden, some of the bands come, come off, right? Right. And I said, hey, what's going on? They said, there's a little fire in the front. I said, oh, okay, well, I'll go tell John. So I went upstairs to tell John Davidson, mm -hmm. and he's just getting out of the shower. Right. And, he, and he, I said, John, there's a fire. He goes, well, how bad is it? I don't know. Right. And, uh, you know, but the band's getting off the stage. Well, go down and find out, because mm -hmm. he's getting out of the shower. Yeah. So, so I, uh, it's I a go. It's visual. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, John Davis was, what, the second centerfold for uh, Cosmo. I never saw that. Back either. in the day. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, it's hey, on your wall no, here. No, no. No. Oh, that's, the, that's the Burt Reynolds one. <laughs> <laughs> he was the second one. Oh, well, Burt was first. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I go downstairs, and uh, the band, more people are coming out. And they said, yeah, you got to get out of here. So I go back. I said, John, we got to go. Right. So, uh, so we, go, we go down. Well, this is kind of interesting. So we go down, and uh, no smoke or nothing, right? And so we go through the opening acts dressing room. Okay. Which, uh, that's a very interesting story too. Who was the opening act? Uh, Teeter and McDonald. Okay. Ventriloquist act. Okay. And so we go through their dressing room and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden John's gone, right? And still nothing, I'm walking over to the uh, stage door to get mm -hmm. out. And then all of a sudden, like, 
like nothing. All of a sudden, it was just smoke in your face. Wow. Out of nowhere. Wow. So I went back into looking for John. John's in the, in the, the bathroom right. of the opening act's dressing room, checking his face for razor nicks. Right? <laughs> I go, John, we got to go. So I grab his arm. We go out right. the door. And probably maybe 45 seconds to a minute, nothing came out that door uh. except a big blast. Uh, of flames came yeah. out the door because the place had the spontaneous combustion oh, yeah, yeah. and it was all red velvet velour uh. and and so when you you know you go through something like that and the drummer playing my drums died oh, you know i saw his wife backstage and uh yeah she was a school teacher uh. and she was grading papers uh. she, didn't, she didn't get out you know so oh, sad man so you you run your life a little differently yeah you, know, you need that. You know, you yeah. really need a reality check every once in a while. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've known so many people who are successful and famous and celebrities and all that bullshit. But I just think not, nothing makes you a celebrity except for the, the greatness you give back. You know, and you, you know what? Things. Uh, probably myself, John Davison, and maybe 30, 40 people came out that door. Wow. It, it, was, a, it was a hallway door mm -hmm. for the service for the bar. Yeah. And you know what? So... Uh, it was interesting because when we played that club that year, mm -hmm. for the first time ever, we played that club many times, for mm -hmm. the first time ever, they had a stage door. And I said to the guys that wow. worked there, well, after all these years, you put in a stage door. Right, why? Why? Yeah. They said, Raquel Welch. I said, wow. Raquel Welch, what? She played here, and she would not go on unless we had a stage door because she wasn't walking through the people. Oh, wow. I said, really? So that was the story in my head all yeah. these years so a few years ago was the 40th year anniversary and i said to my friend er, ernie uh damasa i said you know what you know i've been saying this story that we're all alive because of raquel welch wow. we need to find out yeah and so he contacted raquel's pr person who went to raquel mm -hmm. and sure enough that all happened it's crazy so if she wouldn't have wanted that stage door yeah. i think she had a she had some uh a manager who was a big dancer, Joe, somebody, I don't remember his mm -hmm. last name, but they went and uh, wow. said, put in a stage door or we're not playing. And they did. And that's what John Davis and I and 35, 40 other people got out. Because of that. Because of that. Amazing. So when you go through that, you kind of say, yeah. okay, how, how, what are you going to accomplish in life? Right. How are you going to run your life? Yeah. How are you going to be appreciative that you're here and, yeah. and they're not? I mean, this is the, kind of the stuff people got to hear. Because one thing I've got a huge issue with is, I mean, when I was growing up, I was a geeky kid from Germany, got my ass kicked every day to and from school, so just training martial arts. But, you know, you motivate yourself. Like, you motivate yourself, and you find these people who are inspirational to you. And it, that's really becomes your motivational coach. Because all this stuff you see online, you know, this guy, this guy's a, the, the CEO coach, or this guy's this coach, and they're all telling you how to be successful and write your journal and do this stuff. Just live. Just, just do something. Just yeah. do something great, and that's what will make you great. Like, yeah. forget about this visualization and, and journaling and all this bullshit. I mean, I don't journal. I don't, maybe you do. No, I don't. Okay, good. <clears throat> because, I mean, I think it's all bullshit. You know, I just, I hate this whole, like, I'm not saying Anthony Robbins, but, you know, the whole, like, success coaches who are going to tell you how to be successful. You know, be successful, just do something. Right. You know, you don't, have to, you don't have to cure cancer, but, you know, you can start by, you know, passing a smile along to an old lady or an old man, you know, just shaking somebody's hand and, sure. and telling somebody a joke and stuff like that. That's so huge. I just got to ask you this one question, because I know you play drums. And I'm the hugest Rush fan. You know that Neil Peart just recently Yeah, he was died. a great drummer. Matter of fact, we had the same drum teacher. You're kidding. No. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I, Rush was my number one most favorite band ever. And I, I lived there with lyrics and stuff because they were so powerful. But, my, you know, my girlfriend told me that he died recently. And I was like, I was literally like this empty feeling in my stomach because he was like the legend, the professor, right? Yeah. No, he was a, a great, great drummer. And yeah. uh, we, we both studied with a guy named Freddie Gruber. Oh, Freddie, Freddie Gruber. Yeah. Freddie Gruber. Freddie Gruber was kind of the guru. Wow. And uh, Amazing. Uh, he went there. Well, actually, when I was uh, a kid, I, I, I was in high school. I used to get out of high school at noon, mm -hmm. right? My, How'd uh, you get out so early? Uh, because I went on a... They, what's the Van Nuys High School knew I was leaving them. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. so they put me on a... Uh, uh, I had a great counselor there. He, mm -hmm. he, he knew I was serious about being a musician. And uh, so I had my first period was a stage band. My second period was a band's orchestra. My third period was a band's band. My fourth period was a practice period. And then I would leave. But I would run over to my drum teacher's, my first drum teacher's house, a guy named Chuck Flores. Mm -hmm. And I'd go over there and there'd be a little blue beat up 
uh, Volkswagen out front. And who was it? Danny Serafin from uh, Chicago. Mm-hmm. But, and then, the, then they were still Chicago Transit Authority. Right, right, but right. But he was, uh, you know. Before they just became tr- Chicago. Before, the, before they became Chicago. That's funny. Yeah. That's amazing. So, you know, coming full circle back to, back to Adams, when did you have your first pet? Did, is there something about pets that... I, I mean, know, I've always had them. Okay, so even when you were a little boy. Always had dogs. But you, you wanted to be a musician. That was your thing. And then you found these other things. But what drew you into saying, I'm going to do more for dogs? Well, you, you know what? If, if you would have told me when I was 18 years old that I would have uh, done anything other than playing drums, I would have said, you're, you're just full of it. Because yeah. I was fully only trained to do drums mm-hmm. and music. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would go to school. I'd come home and practice six, seven hours. And when I wasn't at day I'd practice you know eight hours and then go do, do clubs at night right so I was purely obsessed with that mm-hmm. and uh, and I was able to that was my dream and I was able to do it mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and then actually kind of it's kind of interesting so I became entrepreneurial mm-hmm. you know I, I didn't know I was entrepreneurial I mean as I'm playing drums I actually uh, wrote a drum book of solos and I was actually the first person to uh, to uh, sell the pages in the book I, uh, for ads. Okay. <laughs> so I actually sold ads because I, pu- I printed it myself and then gave it to Hal Leonard, the big publisher. Uh-huh. And uh, wow. so that was the first thing. I developed the first metronome, electronic metronome for drummers. I remember in like 76, wow. it was, I spent $10,000, which was a lot of money to me a in 1976. Money, yeah. And uh, I developed the first digital metronome, except I didn't know how to sell it. <laughs> right. I didn't know what to do with it. Right. I had it, yeah. had it all developed, worked with engineers and didn't know what to do with it. I didn't have any marketing chops at right. that, that. So, but I started becoming entrepreneurial and then I created a sitcom pilot and I wanted to make sitcoms because I was playing drums on TV shows right. and I love TV. Yeah. You know, I love the celebrity. I love TV. I love all that. So right. I created a sitcom pilot. We actually made a pilot. What was the name of it? It was called Castle Alley. Okay. Phyllis Diller was in it. And I tell you, that taught me so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, that made me successful in business, that failed sitcom. Mm-hmm. And why it did was I had uh, the producer from Second City Television, which was big. I actually had uh, Dick Martin from Rowan and Martin. Mm-hmm. He, he, he did it. Wow. You know, he used to get, in those days, he'd get 50000 for a pilot. Right. He did it for five. Wow. And when he got asked by Entertainment Tonight, how come you did this, you know, for... He said, I was just fascinated that someone even do this. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and so, he, so I had the top people, right? And, and what I c- created didn't get made mm-hmm. because it, I had all these people. They said, hey, look, you're a drummer. You know, we do this for a living. Right. What you want, studios aren't going to, networks aren't going to buy. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we know funny. We right. know. And so what I created, it went sideways. Mm-hmm. Yet I'm writing the checks. Okay. Right? Yet <laughs> right. I'm listening to everybody and I, I'm making something that I didn't really believe in. And so the end result, when it was all done and I had written all the checks, yeah. didn't work. Okay. It wasn't funny. Right. And I ran into the producer uh, a year later and at, at Ralph's grocery store. Okay. And he says to me, you know, Joey, what you uh, uh, set out to do, he said, you almost pulled it off. He said, you know, next time you need to go with your gut because we were wrong. And I realized wow. from that that if I'm going to be, I have a good gut mm-hmm. instinct. And if I'm going to be wrong and something's going to fail, well, then I want it to be wrong because I was just off. I was, I was off. Mm-hmm. It was wrong. It was a dumb idea. It didn't right. work. I'd rather have it fail that way than fail because I wasn't strong enough mm-hmm. as a leader to say, listen, I know you have a great track record with that, but you know, I don't really like that, yeah. and I don't want to go in that direction. Yeah. So I'd rather fail because I was wrong than fail because I wasn't strong enough as a leader to yeah. say, I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it taught me a lot because throughout the years, yeah. I, uh, there, was, there was things where people in my company would say something to me, and I go, you know what? I disagree with you, and mm-hmm. uh, we're going with it. Right. You know, but you can disagree and still be civil. Oh, you of and course. I have talked about that. Of course, you know? I would never. You know, I I remember uh, one person in our company didn't want to do uh, rose parade floats. I wanted to do rose parade floats in like 2008. I think we did our first one. Okay. And uh, you know, that's a waste of money. That's well, I, you know what? I think it's going to work. Well, yeah. guess what? I did the first rose parade float. We had 2.2 billion media wow. impressions and on february we saw our sales go up wow. so i did another one the next year was 4.4 billion media impressions wow. the next year went to 5 billion 
Uh, one year we had 7.6 billion media impressions. Wow. And, and, and the last year I did one was 2013. That was a surfing one, right? I think 13 might have been surfing. I think it was, yeah. Uh, that's, that's when we sold the company in 2013. And that February was the biggest month in our history wow. of natural balance. Because you stuck with it. I stuck with it. Yeah. I always think a stupid idea, if it's a stupid idea, just let me fail at it. Yeah. Right. You know, just, hey, listen, you fail. Cause if you're wrong, you're wrong. You've got to man up and yeah. say, hey, I, I, you know what? I screwed up. I was wrong. Yeah. But it's better than that than to get in, not having enough uh, backbone to say to people, yeah. hey, you know what? I'm not going that way. I think you're wrong. So what would you say is your biggest failure in life and your biggest success in life? Uh, oh, interesting. Well, it depends what you consider a success. I mean, I think that... Well, uh, no, no, I don't want there, it to there, be like whatever anybody there, else would consider success. There's monetary success. success. Okay, that. that's But that doesn't mean anything. No. I think the fact that, you know, my kids are important to me, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, I want to see my kids succeed. I uh, love them dearly. And that's the... Gl glad I was able to, at this age... I'm 65. Yeah. But I don't you know I'm... Great. I don't know I'm 65. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, my energy level is not any different than when I was 45. Right. So uh, I don't know that I'm 65. Right. Which is why I'm still at this point, you know, good. I want a big uh, animal foundation. I right. want another big pet company, you yeah. know. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I am. That's I, a huge piece. Yeah. It's not, it's not the monetary things. It's not your car or your business. No. It's about who you are. That's your biggest success in life. Yeah. You know what? I actually, uh, 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 had a couple of Ferraris, and uh, uh, and mainly I got the first one because my son was ten. Uh -huh. You know, and we bought a 1992 Ferrari. Right. And you know what? When my son was ten, we used to take that thing places. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And 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 then, you know, uh, we we got another one, right? And I never drove them anymore. Oh, that's funny. I didn't really want to be seen driving one. I, I had no. Yeah. I, I was over that. Yeah. And uh, as it was, they both burned up in the Malibu fire. Oh. <laughs> so. Uh, but you know, it uh, uh, you get to a certain point. Like for me, at this point, it's really uh, about legacy. Yeah. Like what what have I done for the humanity? Yeah. So for animals. In, instead of saying what's your biggest failure, what, what do you think is your biggest hurdle? Like what is your biggest thing to overcome to continue to be proud of who you are? Like somebody else is listening. Well, you know, it's uh, uh, in business. Everything's tough. I mm -hmm. mean, I built a big company, and. I never, it was hard. My wife and I worked very, very hard. And, uh, but I never, ever doubted that we were going to be that. Right. I just kept going through it. Yeah. So now we're doing it again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Lucy Pet, and, and I want to make a difference. And it, it's hard because you can't, you can't do it the way I did it before. Yeah. So you have to be smart enough to adapt yep. because it's a different day and age. So we've surrounded ourselves with, you know, uh, I have I have the best of the old mm -hmm. regime. I have our ho my whole marketing team from Natural Bells. I have them. Great. So we've already been through it, done it. Right. But I also have the young side mm -hmm. who understand the internet and all yeah. those things. So, yeah. you know, I, I put all that together. iPhones. About iPhones, <laughs> algorithms, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. all those kind of Apps. things. Well, you know what? The best thing to always do is, uh, I learned this a long time ago. Actually, I learned about it in 2007 mm -hmm. when the pet industry got attacked by uh, Melamine okay. and all that's 125 Remember. companies. Yeah. And, and I actually grew our company 21% that year wow. in a very serious recall year. Wow. How did we do that? I did it because I ran it not business-wise. Mm -hmm. I didn't do what was, quote, best for the business. I did what was morally correct. Right. And uh, uh, by doing that, by doing what's morally correct, that will be what's best for your business. Yeah. Maybe that's a good piece that people should realize. You know, in anything you do in life, whether it's being a great pet owner to your dog or being a good husband or being a good father or, or a good boss, it's do what's morally correct, even when it's not acceptable. Yeah, right? that's what you do. I mean, if you just do that, you know, things work out. Yeah. And you know what? You can, you can sleep at night going, you know, I did what, I did what was best for yeah. everybody. And you've put millions of dollars, I know, of your own money into the Lucy Pet Foundation, which is super, did. It's super admirable. But everybody can do something, right? Whether it's just it's rescuing a dog or if you sure. have a dog, being responsible and training the dog and giving the dog a good walk. Any little piece is something in the, in the grand scheme hey, of it. Hey, when your dog poops on your neighbor's lawn, pick it up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, come on. It's a great piece, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Hey, come on. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so anyway, you know, so the Lucy Pat Foundation, I think it's a fantastic organization. I mean, I like the way you run it because you run it like a business, which a lot of nonprofits aren't run like businesses. They're run like, you know, passion. Which well, you know, that's what, I mean, I, I went through uh, early on when we got together, I, uh, Dr. Halligan took me through some buses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going through this one bus, who will remain nameless. And when we got out of the bus, I said, hey, what's that big pile of stuff next to the sink? And she goes, Joey, they're reusing sutures. Oh. I go, reusing sutures, isn't that bad? She says, Joey, it's horrible. And then we find out they have a high incidence of infection. Well, of course, you're reusing yeah. sutures. And yeah. I said to Dr. Halligan, this is like five years ago when we mm -hmm. first started, I said, don't ever do anything to shortchange the, the good care coming out of this bus. Yeah. Don't care, about, I don't care what you have to spend, mm -hmm. just do it correctly, yeah. like every animal is your own animal. So if people are listening, there's people listening all over the world to this podcast, but, but how can people get involved in something like, and, and a lot of people listening are in India and, and, and South America and Mexico and all these different countries. How can they find a foundation that does what you do? Or how can they support the work of or organizations like this? Do you have any idea? I mean, well, yeah, just, uh, you know, ask around in your community, mm -hmm. you know, go to the pet shops, find out who's, uh, ask the pet store owners. Mm -hmm. Who's, who are some rescue groups you believe in that aren't, aren't, aren't crazy? Because some right. of them are crazy. There's a lot of them. You know, and, uh, and, and they start out meaning well, yeah. and then it, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And so then they become hoarders. You know, it's and a it's, huge piece. It's a huge piece. Yeah. And so, but find out who's doing the good work. Make sure it's not people who are uh, uh, raising a lot of money but really don't quite give it back to the animal rescue groups. Yeah. So, like, I mean, I always say, you know, think globally, but don't donate locally. Yeah. You know, there's organizations like your organization that when people donate to Lucy Pet Foundation, it goes right into the actual work. There's no marketing expenses, no, no, yeah. no, no, over, no big overhead expenses that are no. killing it. And it's actually being put to use. You know, it's sad when some, uh, some animal charities, you know, they, it, it, it's money machines. Totally. And then to not really donate it out to the people who are in the field doing yeah. the work. You know, well, you see that. They say a penny of every dollar for some of the, I'm not going to mention the big organizations, but, you know, these big organizations, they have the same name as a small humane society, and they're getting all this money, and it's not really coming back. Well, this is very confusing, the whole thing, because you think the uh, SPCA, for example, right. and you think, uh, so there's the SPCLA. They do really good work. Really good. Uh, every individual city has an SPCA, but the uh, so many people think that the ASPCA... Yeah out of New York, <clears throat> funds all the SPCAs. They don't. No, they don't. They don't, yeah. They it's don't. only one organization in one city. That's right. I mean, you, you think the SPCA is like the Red Cross. It's a national right. thing. It's not. It's not. Yeah. You know, it just, uh, uh, it works there. But, uh, you know, so you, you do the yeah. research. Yeah, do the For research. anything, do the research. And if you, any, any group you want to donate to, just go online. I mean, you can find everything yeah. out online. Yeah, nowadays you can. Yeah, you go to Charity Navigator, and what are some of these? So there's a couple yeah. other ones you can look at. Although we're at, still right? not on Charity Navigator, we're too small. Yeah, but I just endorsed you. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to be over like a, a million dollars or something. But there's another one that, that Bound Angels is on. I think you can get on. I forget what it's called, but anyway, do your research. Just if yeah. you're going to donate, to research anything. it, think about it, and do that. So hey, you know what? And uh, whether it's whether it's your pet food, well, we'll talk that about research, yeah, no, research really pet food another time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't get me started oh, on yeah. that. Yeah, no. <laughs> so it's the one thing I always talk about. Everybody says, "What do I feed my dog? What treats do I give my dog?" I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Joey back, and we're gonna talk about food and not just his new brand, Lucy Pet Foods, but um, just the education this guy has, the knowledge he has, the passion he has with with his foundation. And everything is what he puts into everything, and that's why I really want to talk about food because I'm so anal on what I feed my dogs, and we'll talk about that in another show. But um, thank you so much for being here, my first oh, no. guest. You, it was a huge thank success. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I hope your listeners. Uh, yeah. Found something interesting. I think they will. Yeah, I mean, I did. I don't care about that. Because I am your first guest. Yeah, so. and you did a great job. So anyway. Hey, do I get some kind of prize for being your first guest or something? E I'm like going to give you the Burt Reynolds centerfold that oh. I got hanging up there. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to cut the podcast. If Be sure you check out all the other podcasts. Um, follow my YouTube channel, um, Instagram, Facebook, all, all the social media. I'm everywhere. And um, my member section on robertcabral.com has you know tons of lessons on how to train your dog how to interact with your dog how to give your dog the best life possible and i think you're really going to love that thanks a lot and i'll see you next week